Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yep, yeah, we're recording. All right, um, this is a different one than usual. Um, this is going to be just Rachel and I going through some of um, Miyasha's backstory. And um, we had a day here where I'm not doing anything working. I'm still dealing with the whole COVID situation and uh, going through a cold. And she is off today. So we're going to try to get through some things here. Just help develop her character. Um, give it some of that flavor that it needs. Um, she's already written um, about a page and a half of some really nice storyline that has to do with a brother. and has to do with her home and kind of being left to fend for herself. And we're going to work off of that and try to create some really neat stuff so she can get a better feel for Miyasha and who she is. Um, once again, uh, Rachel will be playing the role of this person. Uh, you've seen her on here plenty of times by now if you've been checking out the videos. And um, Rachel, I'm just going to kind of get into, um, well, I'll tell you what, real, real quick if you don't mind doing it and if you do I can I can help you out give me just a brief summary of what happened the day that um Rayhan left and talk well, to me a little bit about that then I'm then we'll go on it was kind of a normal day I mean she'd been arguing with him about this job for about a week and he'd stopped talking about it so she thought yeah he must have dropped it maybe I've actually won an argument with my older brother um, and then that day rolled around and no, he's still leaving. So she was understandably very upset. Yeah. Uh, it took him some time to get her to calm down enough so he could actually speak to her. Um, and then after giving her his chakra and promising he'd come back, she was kind of just in a daze. It didn't really hit that he was going to be gone for, for a long time. He's been gone for a few days before when they've had a lot of money and he's been able to get out of the city, but like he's never been gone for, for a long time. Okay. That's a terrifying thought. Right. True. And, and just for folks watching and to put some clarity on it. So we know that you're a feel day, which is a cat race of folks and you are a tigress. And at this current time, you are roughly, between 12 and 13 years old, female. And your brother, um, and I'm pronouncing that correctly, am I not Rayhan? Yep, you got it. Okay. Um, the, the two are almost a street performing duo. Okay. Um, they, this, the, the landscape in the setting is a city into the far east, which is called Demir. And Demir is my take on um, Persian, Egyptian kind of civilization. And I've, I've done quite a bit of world building there. And there's a lot of legends and really cool um, things to see there. Um, but we've never really jumped into it and dealt with that area too much. So this is going to be a lot of fun for all of us to kind of figure out, you know, someone has actually been there and sees these things. Um, so that's where she grows up. Um, there is a, um, there is a legend that um, is, encompassed around a shrine that was found there. Now, if you know anything about me and my storytelling, um, shrines are these very rarely found, but highly um, respected and studied relics that are found and they lay throughout the whole world of Alwyn. And what they are, are pretty much our, our way of seeing, how can I describe this? Visions of the past. You know, like we have the, the pyramids now and we have all these ancient structures and things that have survived time. And the shrines are kind of like Ulrin's way of teaching generations and civilizations in the future about things that have happened in the past. Uh, these shrines are just damn near indestructible and they are usually heavily guarded and worshipped by many and many different scholars have different opinions about them. And the one main one in the city of Dam Demir is uh, it could be represented two different ways. Some people believe it to be a fountain of youth, and other people believe it to be a shrine that proves that ascension and bloodline should be the ruling body over the sands of the mirror. Um, it's a depiction of three different people, 
um, I can't remember if it was three or four, but the very top person, it's in a large statue, it's probably about 10 foot tall, looks to be of that descent and is holding his hands like this with sand leaking in between the cracks of his hands and fingers. And it goes down into what looks like a younger version of the same person's hands. Okay, very similar features. Some of the wardrobe is the same that they wear. Then the sand trickles down one more time to a younger person's. And then finally to a very, very, very small child at the bottom. And it shows different offerings and things being set around the base of this, and that is the shrine. Um, people think it is proof that there is a fountain of youth somewhere, and they hope to find it, although it still has never been found. But there are a lot of um, theorists that believe they're on the right track, just kind of like in our world. <laughs> and there's also people that believe that that shows that there is an ascension of rule because this character portrayed in this shrine seems to be of someone of a ruling type. They have what seems like a very ancient version of a crown on for that demographic and different things and markings and hieroglyphs written on them that would indicate they are someone of power, kind of like a pharaoh, if you will. So there are different ages that go through her city. And right now they are in one that is pretty much a warlord age where there are people that thirst for the for the eternal youth, they don't care about ascension or descension. Um, and it is a very tough place to live now, let alone be 12 or 13 and be alone. Okay. So when I've got to get used to his name, I'm sorry, Rachel. <laughs> when when Rayhan, do you like Han or Han on the end of it? I would say it's up to you. I am personally fine with either. I couldn't actually decide <laughs> which one I liked better, so I just kind of it sounds yeah. pretty cool. I, I like the the Han on the end of it. I don't know why. It's because it's different. I think I'm going to go with that if I can remember to do that. Okay, no stress. Yeah, and and writing that down. I don't know how the hell I'm going to. Yeah, I'm not the best at that kind of shit. But yeah, that'll work. So Ray Han, I like that. Um. When he decides that he is going to leave, um, it is, he's a very whimsy, whimsical kind of person, okay? When he gets things in his mind, he has big dreams and big ideas. Now, mind you, this is the demographic between a 12-year-old and a 17-year-old, you know? So, w you and I know that he's definitely not as sure as he acts around you, but in your world, he, he is very, this is just the greatest idea ever. This is the thing that will do this for us. This actual trick in this performance is going to be the thing that really propels us over the top, Miyasha. You know, that would be his whole um, way of speaking. Things are a big deal or they're not worth bringing up. And when you see his face and he tells you that he's going to go, it is the most mature and solemn that you can ever remember seeing him. You just can't quite, you've never quite been able to get over that. There was something grown up about that. It was maybe the only true mature thing you've ever really seen him do, other than great feats of athleticism and uh, uh, dexterous skill and things like that. Um, and that may be the only reason why you didn't argue with him more because of the way you two play off each other and the way that you are, you have to show your, stick your chest out a little bit and be a little temperamental to be taken seriously as a young girl, um, especially in the presence of other people. Um, and he's used to that, but you don't, you don't do that on this occasion. There's something very s serious and sincere. Um, this is the same brother telling you this, that, has got up in the middle of the night to make sure that the sounds outside the tent weren't something deadly coming after you. You know, this is that guy that grows up real quick to do the things that you've always needed in your life. Okay. So I want to talk about the next day. Okay. He has told you, and I don't want to play him too much. I'd rather leave that in your mind. You know, you know how he sounds and who he is and things like that. And if we ever revisit scenes of that, I have an idea, but 
I think that conversation, you've done it very well in your description. And I don't need to do anything with that at all. It's great the way it is. So the next morning, let's talk about the place that Miyasha and Rayhan have been staying while they're in the city. Now, mind you, this is Demir. It's not exactly like the nights are cold here. Okay. <laughs> so there are many different places that two street urchins could could stay. Do you have a certain hideout or spot, or do you guys just pretty much make your camp on the streets and different places throughout the city and in, in gr- big caravans and things of that nature? I would, yeah, I would imagine they were a little more nomadic. I don't think, if, if they had a safe house, I imagine it would be ransacked quite often. <laughs> yeah, no joke, right? Um, not just by, you know, enforcement, but like, you know, other street kids. So I think it would be kind of, they'd see it as safer to keep everything close. Okay. Okay. Well, I will say, um, just because of your guys' race and things, and I've been thinking about, you guys were fairly popular, the two of you working together. And you were able to raise quite a bit of coin throughout the day. Now, the problem with it was, being young kids, you tried to spend it quickly so you could just enjoy the fruits of your labor without having to hold a bunch of money on you. So a place that you would have and be able to stay might be at some um, establishment where the keeper there has a, a special place that it keeps open for you too, because you always seem to have the coin and things of that nature. There could be um, uh, a clean part of an opium den that is is made and kept clean for you guys in the back where not so um, decent people go to hang out to do their thing, whereas you have another room off to the side of that. And you don't partake in anything like that, of course, but uh, it is a safe haven for you. And this guy... um, because he has his own demons to keep and doesn't want anyone knowing what's really going on there is willing to make that deal and that trade for fairly reasonable for you guys. Um, I'll say on this particular night, um, your brother fronted up a little bit more and he had been saving some in secret and wanted you guys to have a very good night's sleep. Okay. So let's say that there is a food market. Okay. And I will say that there's a, there's an individual that goes by the name of Zakiri. He is a very tall, very sunken-faced, Arabic-looking man, okay, that wears a, a sash around his face. And he is pretty much in charge of many different food markets around this place, okay? Um, food market. Now I've got all this written down too, so I'll give you copies of it later. Okay. Uh, Zakari, the food market owner. Okay. And um, different times he'll have you perform out by different shops and things that aren't doing so well or have some goods that need to sell and you'll make a deal with him. Um, perform your guys' juggling act and arts and acrobatics there to draw that extra attention and you get a certain amount of the profits throughout the day. Um, Zakiri has these large tents and very lavish temporary setups along the outside of this market and in one of those would be the place that you stayed this particular night. Um, There was actually quite a bit of food there for you guys. Um, You hadn't ate well in several days but this particular night and this day, he wanted to go out with a bang. He really put a lot into the performances throughout the day. And you guys were able to stay there that night. And this Zakiri has left a lot of the food that would be taken off display tomorrow because for normal people, it just wouldn't be, it's been there for a little bit too long. But for you guys, it's like a freaking buffet. It's fantastic. Uh, that you have access to all this stuff. It's like you're breaking the rules damn near. Um, As you've ate through the night, uh, the next morning comes. And I'm going to say that different times throughout the night, you would find yourself waking up urgent, almost like it's Christmas or the first day of school. You just couldn't quite let yourself fall asleep. And every time you did, you're automatically, without thought, look over to see him. 
to see if Rehon was still there, like every hour of the night. He kept looking around, and you would see him, his, him kind of laying on his side, his striped shoulder moving up and down as he was breathing, laying across from you. And it gets to be about 5, 5.30 in the morning, and you pop up real quick, and you almost laugh at yourself because you're getting ready to look again. You've almost convinced yourself that he's not going to go. And then you look over, and he's not there. Mm. And there's this feeling that comes over you. And you, you've kind of, you're just kind of looking at that spot. And, you know, as little kids will fool themselves into believing things, you are kind of stuck in a place right now. And all of a sudden, the room looks a lot bigger than it did before. And all of a sudden, little things start creeping into your mind. What, what do I do tomorrow? Where am I going to go? He actually did it. You know, that reality kind of hits you. Um, what is it your character is doing at that moment? We'll say it's like 5.30, 5.45 a.m. Um, it is a cool night. Um, you can see that the flap of the large tent that you guys have been staying in is wavering in, in the gentle winds. Um, there have been a lot of stand, sandstorms as of nights outside to the western side of Demir. And they almost roll through like pleasant thunderstorms. They almost have a nice soothing sound to them. They never come quite into the city, but on the outskirts in the large fields out there. Um, and you can hear that rumbling off in the distance. Um, what is it that you would be doing at this moment? I'm not sure that she would know what to do. Yeah, and that's, that's a valid answer. The chakrams lay there. He didn't take it like he told you. And the flaps open. Um, a lot of food is gone. You guys ate yourself ridiculous the night before. And as that happens, you see a flash outside from the tent, almost like a heat lightning event. And usually that's something that's a pretty big deal. Um, but, um, you can't help but not really care about it right at the moment. You're still there stuck looking at that chakra and you hear that wind howling and you wonder why didn't he give you more details about where he was going? He obviously doesn't want you to follow him. Mm -hmm. He knows you're stubborn and in your mind, you don't know if you want to search for clues to see where he's went to. You don't know if you want to pack up and get the hell out of here to see if you can find yourself a spot early tomorrow in the market. Um, but you have all these emotions kind of rushing to you. You're, you're, you're panicking a little bit. Chest feels really heavy. Um, not quite sure what this day is going to bring, but he did it and he's gone and it hurts. Um, do you have any clue as to what you might grab up from around the room? If you might stay in there and just go back to sleep, if you might try to get up and, and go outside and look at the storm, if you want to go through and see what kind of supplies you have, anything you want to do, it's on the table. Um, so I think. Not an easy situation. Yeah, I'm putting myself in that area so I don't think sleep is an option if I've been unable to sleep for the last you know throughout the night there's no point trying to do it again and now there's really no point um because I sleeping would be too heavy I need to keep guard as well now which would just come as a sudden rush and oh shit I have to take care of myself yeah. <laughs> um because I've had him to lean on for you know for my whole life and suddenly it's like a oh no I can't do this. <laughs> um, yeah, pretty much. I, I, I know he's taught me how to, and I've seen him. I can learn by watching, but it suddenly hits it. Oh, no, I can't. I can't. I'm, I'm incapable of doing it. Suddenly he seems like air, eh, and I just, I can't live without him. And I think this is going to be the kind of situation where 
you know, you have survival skills. You have things that you know from this place. And it's going to be on situations where you don't realize the things you know until you're forced to try to do them for yourself. Yeah. And I think she's going to have a lot of discovery in that genre. I think it's going to be neat. Um, outside, you see a, a figure walk by the opening flap of the tent. And it looks to be um, Zakari. Okay, I would say Zakari looks to be about an early 40s age man. Stands at probably about six foot four, six foot five. Um, like I say, he wears um, red, black, and gold as his colors. Um, he has flakes of gray in his beard and his mustache, and his eyebrows are very big. Um, large nose, that dark olive colored skin and stuff, and has extra darkness around his eyes and has tattoos um, drawn not only on his bottom lip, but on the cheeks of his face. And he has one singular scarf that he keeps, and he keeps it wrapped around his head for sandstorms. And it's a gold, um, it's a long gold, uh, long red silken scarf that has gold and lays on the outside of it, like flint, fran, <laughs> flinge, fringe, fly on the edges, <laughs> whatever that damn word is. Yes. So um, he stops and he looks in for just a brief minute and believes he catches a glimpse of you. And you, you notice that as well. And it makes your heart race for just half a second. And with that, you hear him grunt as he's sitting down a, a, um, a crate of dates of some kind, and you can hear him sit it down. It scoots against the sand and the stone outside, has that kind of abrasive sound. And he walks over and he takes his large, dark skinned, fingered hand and opens up the tent and looks at you and looks left and right and says to you, So he has gone. She'd nod, sort of just look around too, as if maybe if she looks he'll come back <laughs> okay. um, and yeah just no words just a really sort of a sharp nod that sort of it's a distracted sort of gesture okay as you do that he looks around and goes want to make yourself at home he's paid you up for the week consider this tent yours and he smiles and nods and raises an eyebrow. And he says, the market will start early today. As I have several things, the ones that you two haven't devoured. As he picks up a tuft of grapes, and there's like maybe one that's not so good hanging on. It's the only one left on it. You know what I mean? He looks at you and he goes, always so picky. And he takes it and tosses it to the side of like kind of this arrogant look on his face and rolls his eyes. And he goes, am I, I'm, how would he say it? He goes, I'm filled with delight to think about what it is you'll be doing today. Now that the show is practically yours. And he chuckles kind of grandly. And he says, we both know that that brother of yours did nothing but hold you back, right? And you don't know if he's doing this in a reassuring way, but it makes you feel strangely confident as he sees that you're stewing this over he gives you a knowing nod and he says i'd tell you to go ahead and get some sleep but um <laughs> i can see that's not in your plans good night dolly cat and he moves his hand away from the side uh, different people call you that and throughout the city, okay? His large hand goes back outside, and you're left sitting there, and now you're thinking about, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. Okay? So, get your dice out. We're going to figure out how big of a, how cool of a thing you come up with. All right. Okay. So, we're going to, let's do performance. Hold on. Presentation. And let's do um, 
what is it if I'm teaching you the different moves and steps? I'm teaching you how to be choreography. Okay. And then um, let's go ahead and go with um, those three. Okay. So now I would like for you to play her at a fifth level. Okay. Now, I don't expect you to look at your character sheet and take levels away and be like, oh, shit, wow, I don't know what I'm doing. But the only way I really want this to affect you is if, if it comes to a combat situation or something of that nature, just keep the numbers you have, but only use the abilities that a fifth level version of yourself would have. Okay, so I get you. Five feats that you like, and, and through your class description, go all the way to what a fifth level dancer learns and just kind of stop there, okay? Easy. We'll keep the numbers and everything else the same, just because that's an awful lot to ask you, okay? That's all right. I'll just um, change the proficiency bonus down to three, because I know that's what it is at level five. What, whatever yeah. you're comfortable with adjusting, is, I guess is what I'm getting right. at. I got a decent memory for most of the basic stuff. I'll just um, keep an eye on my class. That bastard DM of yours just made everything overly complicated is all, so you don't want to have to fish through all that. It's all good. That's all right. I think I think I got it. I know I've got my spells listed, the ones that I can cast at each level. I think I'll be all right. I've got everything in notes, so I should be okay. <laughs> cool. Okay. So as you sit there, when you're looking around, and you pick up some dates and raisins and things that are sitting on a little nightstand beside you. You like little sweet things. You start picking them up and kind of placing them around as if it's a bunch of spectators. And then you see this um, silver coin and you pick it up and you lay it in the middle and flip it with your finger. And as it spins there, you're looking at it and you, you imagine that's you dancing for everybody. And you're kind of looking at, hey, you've laid this out on the table in front of you. Okay, so for the performance, I want you to roll a performance check for me. And the higher you roll, the better of a performance that you're able to come up with tonight for, for you to do tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> um, it's a 20, so it's 36. <laughs> wow. No shit. And here's the thing, if that had been a one, it still would have been great. I mean, this <laughs> is going to create stuff, but wow, your brother did hold you back. It's just the first roll of the morning and I'm just... <laughs> You're badass, dude. Oh my God. Good Lord. Save those. Okay, now, that is the idea. We're going to say that helps set the stage. That's the overall theme and thing that you're going to try to do tomorrow. So you have almost thought about juggling and creating a recipe as part of your act, taking the different things that he has and you've thought about them. If you mix them around, you have the different pieces of food and things throughout the, the large tent that you're in inside the city and you're sitting up all these different ingredients. You're thinking, okay, what does this make? What can I make of this together? And is there any way I can incorporate all these into my act? And by the end of it, I have a dish laid out in front of me. A dish laid out that would only need to be cooked to be finished. I'm pretty much taking all the ingredients, sorting them out, juggling, going through the dance routine, putting them in the bowl. And all the person has to do is buy them all in one bowl and take them. And you've never thought about doing anything quite like that before. Um, when you'd mentioned it before, your brother said it would distract too much from the juggling act between the two of them. But now that it's just you, you don't, you need something else to fill that void. So that's what you've come up with so far. Okay. Um, for the presentation, you're thinking about how you are going to collect the individual. You've got the great idea, but now you got to figure out how to dance with turnips and how you've got to be able to do this, that, and the other and make this thing look like it's a dance and still function to do what you're wanting it to do. So go ahead and do me a, um, I want this to be like a, uh, a wisdom. Okay. Okay. 
All right, so that's a 17. Still pretty damn good. Still pretty good. Okay. Okay, um, you look at your chakrams and you imagine how sharp they are. And your idea is that when you toss them up into the air, you're going to chop them up in the air and hopefully they'll land in the bowl where they're supposed to. Um, it's going to be tough to do, but there's going to be some moments in there where we're going to have you doing some maneuvers to see if you're able to catch them in the air and do it the right way. I'm going to say that's a roll 1d6 for me. Okay, that's a five. There's going to be five of those instances throughout the thing. Okay. Okay. Who boy. Okay. Of cuts. Okay. Now that you figure out the how, you know what you want to do, and now you have the how. Now I want you to go around, and you're going to kind of rehearse it in here a little bit. I'm going to say this takes at least two hours of you in the morning, just going around the room with your chakrams and things. And uh, remember, this is a very young version of you. There's no ribbon or anything involved in this. You just simply have them. There's no chain connecting them because you never needed that before. So you don't have privy to those things. And you do have the, the, the garb of a, of a dancer, but it's not the elaborate thing that we've seen you wearing in the games we've been through so far. This is a very basic form, okay? Um, <clears throat> as you go through and perform it a couple times, now we'll just do another performance check. <coughs> oh. yeah, okay. That is a so 18. 18, very good again. It's that plus 16. <laughs> it's, it's Saving a, my life. Oh, you only rolled a two? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my. Okay. Yeah, you have a large, large bonus to that. Okay. So, um, having said that, roll me a 1d6, and we're going to see how many certain times throughout there that you are tested on that merit. All right. Uh, that's four. Okay, four times. Okay, this could be interesting. Just don't use the low rolling dice. It's, I'm just going to move that one over there. <laughs> right on nothing wrong with that okay so we have something set up here it's pretty cool okay as the heat starts to come in through the tent and even the warm winds and even the winds and things that have come in through the night um, aren't enough to keep it cool in here much longer uh, you decide to go out into the day we're gonna say it's about 6 30 in the morning and the sun would just now be starting to come up over top of the city you would hear voices and things like that in the background and um, you see that the market is starting to have certain folks that have certain establishments, very small groups of people are coming in. A lot of them you're familiar with, some you're not. And at that point, just one minute. Da -da 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 names of new people all the time. Um, Zakari. Um, comes up to you and he gives you a long look and he holds you, uh, grabs you by the shoulders and brushes off your shoulder and looks at you for a minute and sticks his chin up as if he's like a dance instructor to some degree and gives you a once over. And he goes, I can see that you have something splendid and planned for today, don't you? Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> he says, eh, as I hope as well. And he says that it's a bit darker than you would like. He, he's, mm. he's very entertaining, and he's happy to be around, but sometimes when he says things, you know there's a darker side to him. There's an intimidation to him. He is a businessman, mm. and although your brother has paid these coins, and him saying it in that way, you know that your relationship with him would, could fall apart if you didn't do exactly what he needed you to do. Okay, it's a harsh reminder that this is up to you now. Okay, so as he has um, set up his market and set up the different things throughout the day, he says, we'll be opening up this stand in about an hour's time. And he goes, I highly suggest to you to go around and explore other people. 
He goes in and look and see what your kind does when they are doing a solo performance. This needs to be good, and you need to stand out and be someone that brings people in here to buy these goods. He goes, in an hour's time, I will have this cleared out for you, and I will give you your spot. What is it I need to have prepared for you when you return? Uh, I need um, a bowl and um, certain ingredients that would go together to make something, a meal in particular. Okay. We'll say you had a really great idea, and although I don't know all their different kinds of foods, um, mm -hmm. I'll say you have this one particular one that does include a lot of things he has there. It includes olives and, and dates and different kinds of peppers and different kinds of things. It ends up being something pretty nice. And he looks at it and he's thrilled by this. He, that's the part of this that you did really good on. And he looks at it and he, he goes, I can hardly wait to see how this, how this turns out. Interesting. This is a large bowl then. Depending on how fancy you're feeling, do you believe you could use a small one or does this need to catch any mishaps maybe you'll perform? Let, let's make it a challenge. A challenge? Yes, a small one. He smiles and looks at you and goes, so be it. He goes off now. I have work to do. I know that she just kind of dry swallows. She's trying to be her brother, but my goodness, she <laughs> has that confidence, not her. <laughs> right on, right on. She said a challenge and then she went, wait a second. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's part of that demeanor that you have. You're always trying to prove the, the tough version of yourself here and hopefully that shit will serve you some justice. I mean, you don't know. You don't know. I'm scared for you. <laughs> so... Yeah, let's see if my eyes can focus here a little bit and I can figure this out. Okay, so there are different things throughout the city and places that you like to go and wander. This place never ceases to amaze you and all the different wonder and things that it has. Now, I'm going to name a couple different places that there are in the city. Um, now, I didn't come up with 20 or 30 because I don't have that kind of time on my hands, but there's some good ones here. Okay. Um, there is a place that you like to go practice singing on the outskirts of the city. And it is called um, Kothor's Cradle. Okay, this is almost like a, a large canyon that is formed in between large rock structures. And it is said that the warriors of Kothar used to train there a long, long time ago. And what they would do is they would sleep on the top of the canyon edges and inside the canyon walls, there are many different hollowed out places that they carved out and made for themselves and they would sleep within the canyon walls. And the reason why the, the warriors of Kothar are popular and famous is because in ancient times, they were the ones that decided to stand up and rise up and slay the sand serpents that were a really, really huge problem around this area. They pretty much sealed off the mirror from the rest of the uh, Western world. Okay. So, um, or I'm sorry, the mirror's in the far east. Everything else is to the west. So yeah, most of the Western world was kept from them because of sandworms and their danger to them. They even had them named after evil gods and believed they had... Um, rare powers and they ate souls and took you to the underworld. I mean, there was a lot of really nasty shit with these sandworms and um, they call them sand serpents. Sorry. Um, and they would go there and they would sing in unison and to draw these things to them and then do battle with them on the outer banks in the tops of these cliffs. Um, that's somewhere where you sneak into every once in a while and you'll go down there and practice singing because when echoes happen there, they go on for minutes at a time. You can't get acoustics like that anywhere else in the world. Okay. And it's a rare spot that you enjoy to kind of go around mischievously on your own. Um, another spot is, this one is much more popular and there'll be more people there, but this is called uh, uh, Arnaki. A-R-N-A-K-I uh, is the Temple of the Mirrored Sky or the Sky Temple. 
okay? Um, this is a place that you and your brother have performed before, but you weren't quite good enough to hold a place there. What this is, is it is a large square shaped pool that is literally only inches deep. And it is, has all these different rugs and all these different um, relics and things laid about the side of it. It's a very ancient um, place of um, prayer and things of that nature. And what happens is it has got a black, um, somewhat of a black like stone bottom to it. And what it does is it looks like a large mirror that mirrors the sky. The water is perfectly still. Okay, and there are different statues and things that erect up out of it in different spots throughout, and they are representative of different stars that are up above them. So in the nighttime, when you can see the scars, stars in the clear sky, it looks like a literal map of the stars on the surface of this thing. And astrologers and people like get out here and perform and look around and use this to um, predict seasons that could be coming up to change. Um, they map things and move these statues around and slide them in this pool um, to disturb those waters without um, asking first or being one of the people that moves the statues is an offense to the people that um, pray there. It's a very beautiful thing. And like I say, it is a, the temple of the mirrored sky. That is a place that you like to go. You know, very high-end performers are there. Okay. Okay, the other one here is going to be... Okay, I, this is going to be about those storms that we were talking about that we're raging through. Okay, as you notice, the storms this particular season are fierce. And it makes you worry about Rahon and what path he's actually chosen to take. And if he actually went towards the west, he would have had to figure out a way to get around these storms. And there's an ancient legend that talks about the two storms. It said that there are two lovers that went off into the desert to find each other. One had been lost and the other one went out to find her, even though he knew it'd be certain doom for him. And they compare them to like the element of fire and ice. Okay. And the problem being is that they say they forever walk the sands out there looking for each other, one representing fire and one representing ice. And they're destined to never be able to touch each other because when the two get too close to one another, they create storms. And it's based on the idea that when heat meets cold, large storms erupt and things like that. So it's a, it's a mythos to why these st sandstorms erupt so frequently out there. And when they do, they say it's because the lovers haven't gave up on each other yet. Okay. Um, there are a lot of different places. You like going rooftops in the city and you like to go and you like to look at the storms. You like to look at the lightning that's created out there and the heat lightning that flashes through. It's a place, it's your Zen place. There are many different rooftops you'll go and look out into there wondering if that's, if there's any truth to the legend. And at your age, you would damn near think there'd have to be. Okay. Let me see if I have a fourth one here or not. Not bad, right? Some pretty good shit there. That is good. I like that actually a lot, <laughs> that legend. And then there are other merchants and things that are on the outline of the city that you would probably have to pass to get to these places. And those, I, I would all have you encounter them as you go. So where would you like to head to? You have about an hour, hour and a half before you have to do your performance. Where do you want to go to? I'm thinking I might gain some knowledge. I might go to Anaki and watch some of the high-end performers if they're already there. See if I can't pick up a few tricks. Awesome. Okay. So as you head out and stuff, you start marching for just a minute, and all of a sudden you find yourself looking over your shoulder like you're almost getting ready to tell your brother, come on, he's lagging behind. And it's a grim reminder of the fact <clears throat> that he's not there. You take a deep breath, and you almost grin in a way because now you know there's all these ordinary places that you wanted to go that he wouldn't let you. 
And that's the kind of feistiness that, that you have inside yourself, uh, Rachel. And with that, you make your way to this um, <clears throat> sky temple, okay? A temple of the mirrored sky. And as you are headed that direction, I want you to roll me a 1d20. 1 is extremely good. 20 is extremely something. Well, it's a 10. It's right in the middle. Okay. Yeah, that actually kind of works with what some things I have down here. Okay, so as you're going, you're seeing different markets and different places, and you're seeing some folks that are selling foods, and you know that they would be in better shape if they were allowed to be in Zakari Square but they're not and you kind of pity them but you almost have this kind of childlike arrogance as you walk by them because you kind of stick your chin up and kind of look at them like hmm, you know it's like not quite good enough are you guys and as you go through you see a man okay and this is a this is an older man than uh what zakari is um, but he's very thin. He looks like he used to be possibly a warrior of some kind. He looks like a mystic. And he has a larger turban, okay, that seems to have two hawk feathers nested into the side of it, okay? And he has hawk talons and things around his neck. Um, he is dressed in purples and blues of dark hues and colors with silver trim around the scarf that wraps around his face and his eyes are decorately painted with that black striking. And he would look like a 68 year old version of Antonio Banderas. Okay. Okay. And <clears throat> as you look through and you read, um, you see it says Rassol's scarfs and dancing supplies. You've not seen this man before. Okay, and as you are there, he walks out and he's looking at different people and there are three or four young men, they range from anywhere from like 21 to 16. And they are standing there and they have like vests on and they just seem to be regular street thugs. Uh, roll a history check for me to see if you recognize any of them. Uh, where's my history? Uh, it's a 19. Okay, so yeah, you recognize at least two of them. Um, you know um, that like most of the kids around here, if they're not guardi guarded or something of that nature, they're into petty crime. They, Some people are familiar, some are not. And there's a couple there that you know have tried to take coins from you and your brother before, and he caught them. Uh, they were doing the trick where it looked like they put one in and then took two out. They were trying to pull a scam like that on you at one point, and you recognize the two of them kind of automatically, and you don't like that kind of shit. Like, not just you don't like it, but you really don't like it, and you're really good at that kind of thing. You have a lot of um, skill points and things put into gaming and being able to see through people's eye lies and shit like that, and when you look at them, do me a, per a perception check, please. All right, uh, that's a 14. Um, they look like they're up to something, but you can't quite make out what it is. Is this 21 year old kid that's with them or young man, um, seems to be a little different and okay. it look, seems to be the ringleader. And he's the one that's talking to who you have to assume is this Rasul, R-A-S-O-U-L. Um, and he holds a scarf in his hand. It's a large, long red scarf that's see-through, and he's holding it and talking about it, while the other um, three or four boys seem to be looking around and picking through his stuff. Rezul kind of nervously looks around, left and right, like, yes, yes, yes. There are many fine things, of course, here that you could look at if you chose to, but um, uh, this one in particular, this one right here in front of you, yes, that's uh, you have a very keen eye. Yes, that is the... That is called the, the tongue of the serpent, a very fine material, but coarse if needed be, easy to hold, yet even easier to bend. The, ter the serpent's tongue, and as he goes on and tells him more about this, um, with that check, you do see the boy pocket something. 
And then he kind of passes it over to another one as he's getting ready to possibly steal more from this rest hole. Um, what is it that you're doing? Okay, so they're bigger than me. What's that? Oh, they're bigger than me, aren't they? They're older than me. They're bigger well, than me. Well, it just depends on how you want to look at it. Um, if you want to size them up? Yeah. I think okay. So. Go ahead and roll um, a. Um, oh, what's the one where if you want to roll to see if someone's lying or not? Oh, insight. Insight. Yeah, roll an insight for me. Yep. Uh, there is my insight. There it is at the top. All right, it's a 14. It's not terrible. <laughs> Okay. In the 14, you know you took care of a few of them before. Mm. And the ones seemed scared of you because you growled and hissed at a couple of them when they were taking the coins and stuff, and they kind of ran like scared chickens. But this 20, 21-year-old young man that's with them, the main antagonist of this that's talking to Rasol, you don't know if you would go on tangle with him so much. Mm. But you also are very skilled in the ways of deception. You're also very skilled in the ways of trying to get in here and do something to stop this from happening. It doesn't mean you have to go up and kick a shell, everybody. You may just have to be a little bit creative. And that's the one thing that your brother always kind of held you back from. And there's been so many times, so many times you know that you could have done things better if it were just left up to you. And now you're thinking, you know, you're walking around, you're doing things. He's not around there to tell you what to do anymore to a degree. And you're like, you know, I'll show him. I'll show him. So I'm going to um, refill my drink and uh, do some things. Think about it for at least five minutes and decide how in the hell you want to go about this. Is that fair? Yeah, I'm okay. good with that. I'm going to pause the recording in three, two, one. Okay, and we're back. All right, so you have a decision to make here. Do you know what you want to do? I have a few thoughts. Um, yeah, yeah. I think because they're street thugs inherently, they're kind of selfish. They're kind of out for themselves more than they are out for the group. That's so I'm fair. thinking I might try to turn the younger ones on the older ones, like convincing them that he's just using them. Okay, and how would you like to go about doing this? So my thought is to approach the two making the steal, okay. um, non-threateningly. Okay. Uh, and as quietly as possible to avoid being noticed by the man, the one running the con, and of course the vendor. Okay, so this this one is running the con, and he's talking to... Uh, da, 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 da. Names, names, names. Rasul. Okay. Um, as you make your way up there, you take a deep breath and tell yourself, you know, it's like, I got this. Okay. Um, you walk up and appear to, and you want to be non threatening. And you're going up to the two younger ones that are in the process of taking these trinkets and passing them along and putting them into a sack that they're carrying. Okay, so with that, I want you to do a performance check first to make sure you're coming off as someone that maybe is shopping as well. All right, so it's a 21. That's really good. Okay, let me roll for them. They are both not, a, there, there's nothing, I rolled a four and a nine on my D20 plus bonuses. So they are, they don't think anything of you other than the fact that, um, well, let me see here. Nope. No, I mean, the one recognizes you. And as it goes to panic and gets a little bit of a deep breath, the other one just kind of looks over and elbows him and nods, says, knock it off, we're busy. You know, and they keep on going about what they're doing. Now they have a second item. And you're getting ready to move it along. Um, are you trying to persuade them that this is not the way they want? Are you going more of a deceitful way of telling them not to do this? Are you trying to be intimidating and threatening them? Each one has its own set of skills with you. You have to depend on how you want to go about it. 
think my best course of action is to lie because I don't know anything about this older um, leader, ring leader. So I think right. my best course of action is to tell a really good lie. <laughs> okay, so go ahead and roll me a deceit, a deception, okay? And yeah. remember, you probably have skill points and things on that, if you're not yeah. mistaken. So make sure you add everything into it and roll a good number. Yeah, because so my thoughts are I might uh, work the angle that, uh, hey, my brother's worked with this guy before, and he ripped him off. You know, once everything was said and done, he got nothing. And I think you, I know you two, we don't get along, but one street kid to another, you should be careful and stop working with him. This hey, is going to well be bad done. for you. That's cool, yeah. Come on! It's a 27. Okay. Damn. Okay. So at this point, let's just do a thing here. Roll 1d6 for me, please. Sure thing. Uh, all right, that's a two. Okay. Some will say there's the two kids here running the scam. There's him, and there's one kid on the other side. There's going to be four all together. Okay? But there's just two here by you right now. It's these two here. The one that kind of recognized you and the other one that you don't quite recognize, but they're both younger. One's about your age. One's maybe two years older than you. Okay. A natural one. Okay. So the one that recognizes you is a little bit harder sell, but you still far outperformed him in this role. Okay. So the one looks at the other one and elbows him a little bit. He says, see, I've told you, man, this stuff is not good. We're out here. Everyone can see us and stuff. It's in the middle of the day, for God's sake. He goes, shut up, man. He goes, shut up. He looks at you and goes, why are you trying to help us? Well, like I said, my my brother was, well, he was cheated by him. And I, I don't like, I don't like the idea that other people are going to go through that. I, I don't like you. Don't get me wrong. I don't like you. But I, I don't want to see you being taken advantage of by someone who is older and more capable and will very likely just take everything from you once this is done. You're putting your lives on the line, you know? You could get caught any minute now. Okay. All right. At that point, you hear a voice say out in a young um, voice, um, urgent almost like an older brother kind of thing. And what I'm going to say, this guy, I know this, you're going to think this is hilarious, but this guy looks like the singer. Um, oh, what the hell is his name? Uh, pe people are going to watch this and want to kick me in the ass. Um, what's his name? He says his, he sings that song, I Could Be Your Hero. Um, David Bowie? No. no. Oh, God, no. See, I like where your head's at. That's more what I'm into. It's, um, he's a... Uh, Oh my God, if I do his voice, you're going to laugh your ass off and I've got a cold. <laughs> um, um, I could be your hero, baby. No, not Diesel. Diesel? Exactly. No. That, that singer. Henry you Kane. can't Please take no. my breath away. <laughs> that oh, is he? You know who I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, because his, his father was a singer too. And then he's a singer after him. So I'm going to say he looks like that singer. Okay. God, people are going to be like, I can't, don't know how you didn't know his name. <laughs> so that's the guy. Um, very handsome, very devonier, very skinny um, person that looks Arabic in that nature. And he yells across there. And he says, bro, Krill. He says, what are you doing? At that point, um, Rasol. Um, looks down onto the group and notices and locks eyes with you and looks up through his eyebrows at you for a long moment and looks at the group. Okay. And he says, perhaps you as well would be interested in some of our fine scarves. I think I have one here that might suit you just fine and he looks at the two boys beside you as you think he's noticed something razul has seems to have keyed on that something is going on at that point um the large central um character the one that looks like that singer 
um, is trying to reel him back in and talk to him about this serpent's tongue satin piece that he has. And uh, as he does that and does not work, um, Razul looks over at him and he goes, there's another feature of this fine fabric that I have, I have yet to show you. Nikum, watch what can happen if you would pay top dollar in coin for my unique and rare gifts. And with that, this piece of fabric springs to life in his hands as it seems to be animated, almost like some kind of small serpent, okay? Keeping its shape, almost like, a, you know how you have a magic carpet? This seems like a magic scarf. And as it does, it zips across and whips in between you and the other two kids, wraps around the one's hand and comes over and then picks up what looks like to be some kind of lantern that's made out of bronze and things out of the back of him like this and holds it up. And he goes, it seems you guys were trying to do a little extra shopping while I was teaching you about my fabrics. At that point, um, the tall one um, pushes him into the chest and knocks uh, Rasul back into a, a bunch of crates under his tent as one of the front forks of the tent falls down, the front starts to collapse. And as he does, three more scars of different colors pop out from underneath of the tent and come out almost like they're air serpents and they're alive and they're there to defend him. One blue, one green, and one a very brilliant color of yellow almost looks like you're staring at the sun with long fringes in the corners that hang off like tassels. Now three of them just come out and start surrounding and circling around the group. Um, as attention begins to get drawn, um, all of a sudden you're looking at the two beside you. One's wrapped up with the serpent's tongue, the red one, and the other thing has the lantern, and the lantern goes right by the front of your face as you're just kind of seeing this magic, just completely bewildered by it, and as it drops it, the scarf comes around and whips and looks straight at you. What are you doing? Uh, honest, I, I is he okay? Like, I, I, as soon as he went through that crate, I think her attention would have just shifted um, to that. I mean, this, this man's not young, uh, not that she can tell, and that could, he could be injured. So I think her her focus is kind of on that, and okay. sort of can I can I help him? Yes, should I? <laughs> okay, Do you run over to his aid to see what's yes. going on. I would say so. Yes. Okay. Excuse me. As you do, you go to run past there, and these two seem to be preoccupied with that scarf. Um, I mean, your intention again is what to go over to aid to see if he's hurt. Yeah, I think okay. so. The scarf, the the red one, the serpent's tongue, seems to yield to you and let you go that direction. Okay. <laughs> as it deals with and is wrapping up the two boys as they're screaming in fear at this thing wrapping all around them and smacking them in the face and twirling them and pulling them. It's just a comical scene what's going on with this thing attacking these two young ones. Um, you run over and flip up part of the uh, tent. And as you do, you go over to this man. He's laying in between two crates. One's broken. The, the three uh, scarves seem to be out there uh, fending off this main central character and his other buddy, okay? Um, as he looks over to you, he's moving pieces of wood and he looks up and he locks eyes with you and your eyes kind of shine underneath the shadow of this fallen thing. And he looks at you for a long moment. And he goes, <coughs> so you're telling me you're not with them? No, are you okay? It's down to city. It's gone straight to hell since everything. Oh my. And he says like that, um, you see him looking over top of your shoulder. Oh God, I turn around. <laughs> uh, when you turn around, there is a long falcon-like blade that is pulled and is drawn and is pointing at the back of your head by your ear. Mm. Okay. As this adult there says this, and he says, Where's your brother? I thought I recognized you. Uh, 
I don't know where he is. As you say that, he looks over at the other one. And uh, the other one seems to have um, two to three daggers stuck in between his fingers. And he seems to be a shorter human male with a large, uh, very young beard. Um, it's in the starts. He seems like he would probably be like 19 or 20. So you're dealing with two of the older ones now. And he mm -hmm. looks at you and he says, so what you're saying is now you're us up for grabs as this man's wealth is to me. Yes, but do you really want to try that? At that point, the three scarves go over and start attacking his friend. And he looks at it and he holds the sword closer to you like that. And he looks at the old man, the uh, rasul, and he says, call him off. Do not call them off. Roll persuasion check. All right. It's not great. Makes sense. She's terrified. Um, that is a 13. Okay. As you say that, he can feel the, tr the tremor in your voice and things like that. And he looks around. Um, um, Russell tries to push himself up out of there, the Antonio Mendez looking person. He takes that scarf and he unwraps it from around his head. He has very long silver and black hair that he's let grown into quite a long braid that drops on the floor, almost like a mystic wood. Um, you see different spices and different oil lamps that have fallen over back in here and stuff. And it's dark underneath this tent for the moment. And he looks and he says, if it is coin that you would want, it is coin that you shall have, but no harm is to come to anyone in my presence. I need you to roll initiative. Okay, okay. All right, so that is. Da -da -da -da. Where are we going? Okay, here we go. So it is twenty seven. Wow. Okay. Okay, and now for Russell. I'm sorry. It's all good. Okay. You are going to go first in this scenario, which is fantastic. Here's what you've got. Okay. Um, I'm going to draw a square in my paper here. Okay. Just like a rectangle. And I'm going to say that is the front of the tent that is actually falling down. Okay, the front right corner of that square, I'm going to put an X on. That's the stake that has been taken out. The one on the right, I'm going to put a check, or the one on the left, I'm going to put a check mark on. That's the one that's still upright. So the right side of it is falling. The left is still staked up. The front drapery of this tent is still is hanging down. I'm going to put two small boxes towards the back of that. Those are crates. In the middle of that, I'm going to put a circle with an R in it. That's going to be him. Okay. Um, I'm going to put two circles to the bottom left. I'm going to make those two for T's for thugs. And I'm going to put a, a S curling between them, representing the red scarf. Okay. Just underneath of this, in the darkness, with the sword drawn on you, is this leader of this group, which you still don't know the name of yet. Okay. And then over to his side is going to be this other one, this henchman that has a very wiry beard, a short, heavier person with a bigger um, kind of sash over top of his head. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call him. Got it. Okay. Give him the letter K. You 
are going to be to the side of Razul. Okay, you're going to be within five foot of Razul, within a uh, ten foot of this central character. He's reaching out and lunging that sword out towards you. It has reach. Okay. And then the other guy is about 10 to 15 foot away from you underneath this large tent area. The whole tent area itself, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, is 30 foot by 20 foot rectangle. Okay, so I have it drawn up here. If you want a dimension or something at all, I, I can tell you what's going on. Um, what is it that you would like to do it's a, it's the start of this battle. This guy has a sword drawn out to you. You don't know what kind of feats he might have. He could just be bluffing. Mm -hmm. But who knows in this crazy world that we of D and D that we play. So, what is it that Miyasha would like to do in this situation? I think. Mm. I think, all right, this is sold to my throat, but I think. And he's like, got it. When you turned around, it's like at your ear. It's like right oh, here. Like, the okay. Head. Yeah. Okay. That's not, that's not okay. That's less of a, okay. Um, I might tack. I'm, I'm fairly confident I could probably kick him and it could, it might hurt. And right. <laughs> Um, I love that you're like searching for answers as you're asking me. You're like, I might just kick him. Yeah, I'm just like going to the mind of someone who's quite young and is not used to being sort of powerful, essentially. And I'm trying to sort of make sure that it makes sense within that realm as well as within me, who's just like, yeah, just kick him. Statistically, yeah, right on. No, yeah, I get it. Like, it's like, <laughs> and I think this is going to be one of those steps where you start getting some independence. Yeah. Uh, so I might. I'm seeing this happen. Yeah, I might lash out with um, a kick and see how we go. Okay. Um, and I know I have Dance of Misdirection, which, if I remember correctly, means I can attack as a bonus action. Mm -hmm. uh, and with the improvement at level four, no. It. And then it's it's a secondary. But okay, I get it. All right, so I'll do two attacks first. Use a dance of misdirection on the second one. I have to say it out loud, otherwise I'm gonna jump the gun. <laughs> perfectly fine. I just want you to know that I know that you've played for a while, and this is this is a very cool but complicated class set that's new which we're play testing as we go. So anyone watching this, uh, you know, give Rachel a break. She, she does it well. I've seen her. And if you have some questions, I'll guide you through it. If not, I mean, I, I wrote them pretty decent where I think the answers are there. You just have to be able to sort it. through it. No rush. It's just you and me. Right. No one else is waiting. So you're all good. All right. So I'm going to roll an attack. Okay. Uh, and that is a 24 to hit. A 24 hits and breaches. Now you need to tell me what you're attacking first. All right, uh, I am attacking, I will say, his, the section between, uh, behind the knee in an attempt to sort of stagger him. Okay, cool. Okay, so that's a breaching hit. And I will say his clothes aren't exactly made of anything kind of hard. He just wears an outfit of things of that nature. So when you go through the back of his knee to offset him, you're able to hit that area successfully. Go ahead right. and roll damage how you would want to. All right, neat, 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 neat. Uh, so that one's a six plus four. Yeah, okay, so that's 10 damage. Damn. Um, and, um, I, I'll roll a second attack and use the combo attack feat to nice. get that. This has a plus one to hit then. Yes. Uh, which is a 28 to hit. That one definitely breaches. That one does very, very well. And okay, then. So you went in, you hit the leg. 
okay? Mm -hmm. Now you've done another breaching attack. You know you have him where he's putting favoring weight on the other leg now, where you've done that. What is the other, where's the air attack going? Just general. So if a little bit more sort of within my reach, I'm imagining he's quite tall and I'm quite small. He is, yes. Uh, so if he's a little more in my reach, I might go for the ribs. Okay. <clears throat> and this is another kick or is this a claw or what is this? Uh, I'd say another kick. Okay. I'm going to say kick the side of the leg to buckle it, to bring him down yeah. a little bit. And as you did, you drew your knee back into you and extend it out. And you've kicked him in the side of the ribs now. And he buckles yeah. to one side. I want to do something for him. Oh, he failed horribly. Okay. You, you feel the wind knocked out of him as you feel a crack as you hit mm. that foot. Go ahead and roll damage on that. All right. Uh, that is a seven. Okay. And he is dazed. Okay. Um, and then combo attack. Now that I've done two in succession means I can make an extra one at the end of the combo. Correct. Um, which gives me advantage and normal That's, damage. And, and I think it's, if combo attack is correct, I think it's advantage and damage plus half on this third attack. Yes. Yes, it is. Plus half. It's yes. just dice rolls, okay? I'm getting there. <laughs> no, it's all good. I wrote it, so I should know, for God's sake. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that one's 25 to hit. Mm. You are just breaching this guy all day. So his defenses, you're getting past them. He's not, he's not able to stop you with the sword, even that was even out the way it was. So now that you've cracked him in the ribs, he is, he is dazed. And you can mm. see him yell out in pain um, as he does um, that shorter, heavier guy to his side that seems to have some kind of like club or flail onto his side. Or not, I, I will say it's like a mace. Okay. okay. Um, he yells and he goes, Ammon. He says, I'm getting out of here. Um, with that, um, we'll, we'll go into that action in a minute. Um, You've rolled a really good hit. What is your third attack? What's it doing? I would like to try and sort of kick the sword out of his hand rather than do any more damage. Okay. Okay. So is this your disarming strike? Uh, I wasn't 100% sure if I was able to do it, but if it is a possibility, I could make it a disarming strike. I mean, you have, a, uh, you have that feat, don't you? I believe I do. Okay. Um, let's have a look. Um, yes. <laughs> With a big question mark on the end of it, that's fine. <laughs> Just triple checking. It's all good. I don't want to get it wrong. Yes, I do. Okay. Yep. 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 Okay. It tells yes, you yep. there what you have to roll to do it. Okay. So. All I have to do is pass the primary to initiate, which I've done, mm -hmm. uh, and then they have to roll a dexterity check. Okay. Um, which is one d twenty plus their uh, bonus only, in order to keep hold of their weapon. Okay, and your role was just to hit that, and if they, the DC is what you rolled the hit with, right? So it's a twenty-five. Yes. Which is really high. Uh, no, almost does though. Almost <laughs> does. Um, and as that happens, because he only had one hand on it, see if he'd had two hands on, he'd got bonus bonuses. But uh, he just had the one pointing at you, and as you hit it, it takes just a moment for it to flip out of his hand, but it does. Uh, what direction would you like it to go? You're able to throw it ten foot. Yeah. Uh, so I'll say uh, sort of just. There's all kinds of neat things. You've got all the different directions. You've got the other pegs of the tent. You could throw it out in direction at somebody else just to kind of scare them off. You yeah, I was thinking that. Anything. I, yeah, you got all kinds of shit. I might throw it at his friend, sort of in that direction. Old Tubby over there? Okay. Yeah. That'll work. Go ahead. And when you launch it in that direction, that doesn't really count as an attack. <laughs> but it does fly over there towards him. And I'm going to say just for the hell of it, roll me a 1d20. 
Sure. That's a 10. Okay. <clears throat> so it goes over and flies off in his direction, and he stumbles on it. It is prone as he's trying to run through the side of the tent that is actually pulled down, and you throw this blade over there between his feet, almost like kind of like a bola, <laughs> <laughs> and he gets trampled up in it and goes down on one knee as he's trying to run away. Um, I'm not going to lie, you probably see a little butt crack. As he's falling and trying to do his thing. I just, it's got to be honest. Theatrics, man. Okay, um, so that's one, two, three. You had two attacks. They both hit. You got a free extra attack because you hit him in succession. Now what are you doing? I think I uh, will just use my free action to speak and just uh, very cockily say, had enough. Okay. Roll an intimidation check of that. Sure. All right, uh, where is my sheet? There is intimidation. All right, it's not too bad, it's a 17. It works. Oh, good. You're on natural four. <laughs> oh. So yeah, I'm not doing the best on my rolls tonight, kind of sucks. All right, so um, with that, um, the reaction from him without his sword and the guy running from him and all the different scarves um, coming about, he looks at you and he says, um, and you've intimidated him. So I've got to play to that effect. Um, he says something along the lines of, he goes, this isn't over. I know you're alone here now. Uh, I might lean down, um, put a just one claw just under his chin, and say, "Right, I'm not alone now. But just remember, I kicked your ass. Okay, I don't need my brother to defend me." Okay. With that, he looks over at the sword, and um, Razul. Um, says a couple words in Arabic, and as he does, uh, the yellow scarf from outside comes over, wraps around that sword, and brings it over to him, like as, as some kind of low-level magical spell, and puts it into his hand. And as he does, he stands up, and a green fire starts to wrap itself around the actual falcon that this um, Amen uh, had inside of here. And his eyes light up and have a darkness to them, okay, as they have a green flame and kind of a green hue to them. From the darkness, um, Razul looks quite wicked. And he, he says, uh, it would seem you've made two ill omen decisions on this day, Amen. Be lucky you leave here with your life. Now go. With that, he turns and goes to run away. Uh, would you like attack of opportunity against him as he goes? Or are you no, I think uh, she's more surprised she managed it than yeah, anything else. He rolled a really good roll. Uh, <laughs> as that happens, he comes over there, and uh, he stands up in between the two uh, crates, and he looks to you for just a minute and kind of gives you an uncomfortable kind of nod as he throws his arms out like this, and as he does, the, the tent front flaps open and stays, almost like a magic carpet would. Um, he looks at the one scarf and says another word. It picks up the peg and sticks back underneath the one. It's standing up again now. As he looks, and he, he does a symbol like this of his fingers and lays out his hand flat, and as he does, the other two kids, which are like 15, 20 foot away now, the ones you were trying to talk sense into, the... Um, the what I call it this the serpent scarf what I call it the uh, serpent's serpent tongue, tongue. Yeah. It, was, yeah. it it wraps from around them they both fall down as it comes back over and wraps itself around um, Razul's arm okay and then you realize that his body and his outfit he looks like some kind of mystic but a lot around his legs and forearms are wrapped other scarves hmm. okay the yellow one, he calls, calls back to him, and it wraps back around his neck as it was and ties itself and lays down straight. 
and then the other ones, uh, the ones that defined his color, wrap back around his face and go up around his head and stuff, as now you can only see the nose and the painted up eyes peering out from underneath. He looks around, says, what a mess. I'm sorry, I was trying to, I didn't want them to get into, I, <sighs> sorry, I didn't mean to damage anything. He looks at you. And he says, I, I should be grateful that you are not the thing that was damaged. The outcome seems to be favorable for both of us. And you are? Oh, uh, <laughs> Miyasha. My name is Miyasha. Miyasha. Mm -hmm. It seems as though I have heard this name, but it usually is accompanied by another. Uh... Yes, uh, that would be my, my brother. Um, whatever you heard, only the good stuff is true. The bad stuff, it, we didn't do it. Because we all have our bad stuff, Miyasha. Mm. As he looks outside and he sees his sign laying down on the ground, he picks up the sign and he looks at it and he turns it over and he goes, I am <coughs> Razul. And he says it sarcastically, as the sign would imply. Master scarf maker and tamer of the elements. He takes it and hangs it back up on si outside the flap. That is uh, that, that kind of like a small flap that hangs down off the front of the, the tent. Um, as he does, um, he looks back over to you. Um, he says, have you always been able to take on others as you have just now? Uh, it's not, I mean, it's not usually, I'm not, uh, I mean, yes, but I usually don't try it when I'm alone. <laughs> he looks at you for a long moment. He says, I find myself alone as well. I haven't been here for some time. I've seen the far west. I'm just not coming back from my journeys after learning more about my trade. He says, I could use a, uh, a bodyguard. And you, can't, you don't know if he's patronizing you or what he's saying to you, but um, roll an insight check. Sure. That is a 17. Okay. Uh, he means what he's saying. Okay. And uh, he says, I have found it's, very, it's much safer to be in this city when we are in groups of other ones that we can trust. He looks down at that oil lamp that that boy was stealing and picks it up and looks at it and looks at you. And he says, you're skinny. He says, Sorry, just... Boys, have you always been this way or, oh, go ahead. All right, just one second. Um, I'll be right back. I just gotta make sure that nothing's, there's a lot of loud noises. I'm just gonna make sure everything's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's cool, go ahead. It's good stuff. Oh, goodness. Okay, it's fine. It's a wood delivery. I thought it was like... <laughs> oh, do you guys have wood burning stove? Uh, we have a, a wooden fireplace. <laughs> awesome, dude. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yes, yeah, sorry. Um, last thing you said. Sorry. Oh, no, no, it's no big deal. It, we're just having some fun. Um, so the last thing he said was you were able to tell that he was sincere in yes. his offer for you to be kind of his bodyguard in, in this place with the... Uh, scarves and he says it would uh it would appear that you dance nearly as well as they do uh i i suppose i i haven't really had the chance to thank you <laughs> i um because no my dear thank you you've just saved me several days worth of merchandise who knows where that would have escalated and it would I... be nice to have a second set of eyes when I am watching and dealing with my customers. Does it, 
I'm sorry, this is so rude. Does it pay? <laughs> Does it pay? Doesn't everything pay? Sometimes, not, not all the time. Sometimes, no. He says, I tell you what we'll do. We'll work out some conditions. Okay. I'll give you the day to think about it. Okay. okay. But as long as you're here and every, for every person that you catch that is trying to take something from me, I give you part of that sale. He goes, every time you've possibly entertained here in front of my stand and bring people to us so I can sell these scarves that I've created, I will give you 10% of the sales that I can see that you've personally brought in. The busier I am, the richer you become. Okay. 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 I'll uh, I'll think it over. Okay. Um. Roll a um insight check. Ugh, it's a five. No wait, that's an that's an eight. Um. That is uh. That is not. That is not a. That is. I thought that was a five. Uh. <laughs> that's ten. <laughs> okay. You're not sure if ten percent is a good deal or not. You didn't deal with many of the numbers and things like that. That was more your brother's kind of gig. But yes. you have that number in your head now, 10%. 10%. 10, 10, 10. You know, it's in your head now, and you're trying to you're trying to weigh your options. But you're not quite sure what the fuck that really means, you know, in the mm. grand scheme of things. Okay? So, um, from there, um, he goes back into his whole spiel and starts talking about selling – uh, more scarf, scarves, and he says something to remind you of me and my offer. Uh, keep it with you. Um, it will find its way back to me as the sun goes down tonight. Maybe you could follow it, maybe it won't be alone. And that serpent tongue's scarf comes over, still extraordinarily animated, and goes up and wraps around his shoulder and sticks up and looks at him almost like a snake's head. And he looks over and he whispers some words to it and looks at you and nods. It looks reluctant as a scarf could, but after that it takes itself and it goes over towards you and it does one 360 around you slowly as if it's underwater. Okay. And as it does, um, he's waiting for you to offer him a perch. Oh, uh, Okay, I might offer up, sort of just upper shoulder, upper arm. Okay, uh, as you do, it goes over and it feels cool to the touch. Okay, and strange, you get a weird sensation from it. It is magic. And it wraps around your arm in this beautiful kind of dance, and it goes over and it lays down into your palm at the very end of it. Almost like a pet's would lay into your palm as it wraps around your arm. Um, I will say that this is the beginning of the inspiration for you using these kind of sashes and ribbons in your dance in the future. I like that. I can see that. Definitely. Okay. So, um, now that you've done this, where else would you like to go? I'm going to say that was about 30 minutes. Where else okay. would you like to go in the meantime? Um... You can just go hmm. back. You can make something up. It's, it's all, it's our world, man. It's all good. I might just wander for the next half hour, like sort of gradually back towards where I need to be. Just kind of let everything turn over. Yes, as I absolutely. Go. absolutely. So as you do go and your, your initial thing to go there was to see other people perform. I'll say you do a lap around the, the temple of the mirrored sky. Okay. And as you do, um, you see what would seem to be a priestess of the sky out inside of that water and they walk on top of it without touching it almost as if they're gliding when they move these statues. They're not allowed to disturb the water. It's very mystical and, and there's a lot of music being played along the sides for them. It's almost like this kind of vibe. You almost can't help but move your shoulders to it as you walk along this area. You can feel the, the serpent's tongue um, unravel itself and move in a curious wind like blown pattern along your arm as it feels the beat of this place as well. Um, you find yourself walking along the edge, looking at yourself in the reflection and holding up your hand and looking at the thing wrapped around you and looking at your chakrams 
slapping on your sides where you have them tied around your belt. And you can see the bright reflection of them striking back up out of you from the mirrored water. Um, it makes you want to look up for just a long moment into the sky and you see the waving sky because it's very hot at this point, the heat vapors. Um, as you continue to walk around, you see several different musicians um, playing all sorts of um, foreign instruments. Um, you would see people doing juggling acts and knowing that you could do better, that you have done better. And that, you know, if you were to practice more, you could have a place here, but, you know, it's just now dawned on you. If you take Russell's offer, you will be amongst this group. Fate has dealt you a very favorable hand today. Um, as you make your way um, further around and back down the other side of the, of the mirrored water, um, let's see. Roll me a 1d20. Uh, that one is a 13. Okay. As you do, um, you would see off in the distance, you would hear a little bit of a commotion. Okay. And as you do, several chickens come flying out of crates and things over to the side. As you see this pot spin out into the middle of an alleyway. Um, some of the priestesses, um, you see the water start to wave almost as if there's a little bit of turbulence on the mirrored lake. And you see some of the priestesses look that way and say a couple words and snap as if they want guards to go over and stop the disturbance. And as you do, you see a young man um, jump out from the side and he seems to have the half, half vest and just a very simple bandana wrapped around his head, very, very baggy pants and barefooted. Um, and he seems to be trying to catch this large vase that seems to be spinning out of control in the middle of the street. And from it looks to be a 20 foot tall dust devil that is just like a literal dust devil, like you'd see out in public, spinning nonstop, coming out of this urn and just going off and picking up things on the street and throwing them and being extremely windy. Clothes lines are getting caught into it and stuff, and animals are getting kicked around. He's out there trying to wrestle this, trying to get the lid back on it. This is probably about 40, 50 foot away from you. Um, as it blows past you and disturbs the water, you couldn't help, but how do you want to react? What do you want to do? Um, hmm. I might help. It might, it might work out for me to have someone indebted to me. Okay. Um, so the way in which you want to help do this, how would you like to do it? It's about 50 foot away. It's down an alleyway that cuts in between a bunch of several different layered buildings and structures. It looks like the city behind you, of course. And, um, this thing seems to be whipping along. You don't see it to be naturally that dangerous. It is extraordinarily windy and it's howling and making sounds and sand seems to be flying about the closer you get. Um, but how is it you would like to help in this situation? Um, so I'm imagining he's struggling to hold both the vase and the lid and the, so I might uh, take hold of the vase and try and hold that still so he can focus his attentions on the rest of it. Okay, how do you go over to him? Do you dart towards him? Do you run? Do you walk cautiously? Or how do you do it? Uh, I think it would be a mixture of like kind of it's, it's urgent because obviously it's out of control, but I think there'd be a level of caution. Like if I get close, is he going to attack me or am I going to get injured? Or Okay, let's have fun with your character here. I know that you can dance your way through difficult terrain. Yes. Use that ability and let's see how you get through these winds and how this all affects you. Okay, okay. Uh, here we are. So, let's see. It is under Dancer. It is under Okay, so. Okay, we can. I could use uh, the tumbling routine as a fluid motion. That work. Um, is there anything that needs to be rolled for that or just lets you move normally in difficult terrain? I think it just lets me move normally through a series of flips and jumps and yeah, acrobatics, that's it. 
Okay, for just the hell of it, do me an acrobatics check. Sure. All right, that is a 19. Total? Yeah, you're 19 total. Okay, all right, just a minute. <clears throat> Okay, so as you get closer, uh, there's a couple things that you recognize. As you start cartwheeling and making your way through this, um, it gets very loud here, and your vision is obscured by sand that seems to be swirling around the base of this. As you get close to it, you see that this person that is wrestling with this is not a boy at all, but it is a girl that is dressed up somewhat like a boy. Okay, you can see her long hair has blown out from underneath of her wrappings. Uh, a pretty little thing, I would say maybe one or two years older than you. Okay, uh, she seems to be a very, the, the native race of this place and has very beautiful golden colored eyes. Okay, and as she rustles around with this thing, trying to get a hold of it and stuff, you're reaching out for the vase itself, right? Yes. Are you saying anything to her as you approach? I would say, I think it would be, I mean, your harm. I'm trying to help with the hope that it would be heard, but. <laughs> okay. Uh, go ahead and roll a, uh, I don't know, what do you think for yelling loud? What do you think? Charisma? Let's try it. Let's try it. Let's see what happens. Right. You're mm. cheerleading stat. <laughs> I mean, shit. What do okay. you want to Oh, it's a 13. It is dodgy. <laughs> um, so what is it you're trying to say so I can interpret it? Let's go with, uh, I mean, you know, harm. I'm here to help. <laughs> You're giving her the whole FBI speech. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Okay. So as you do that, she hears you say, harm, help. Okay. That's the two things she gets from this. Let's see how she reacts to these things. She is utterly confused with a natural one. <laughs> That's fair enough. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Let's have some fun. So who do we want this character to look like? If you have a favorite actress or something, um, you're more than welcome to throw it in here. But let's just kind of create this as we go. This person could be important on down the road. So we know they have, she has the golden eyes. She looks of this nationality in this country. Um, just a little bit older than you, not very much. Um, so I'm actually trying to think of actors, musicians, singers. People that look like that. Can you think of anyone? My. Um, well, I've got one. If, if it's okay. I don't know what her nationality is, but she could play that part in the movie. Um, what is the young lady's name that played in the most recent Spider Man movies as his love interest? Oh, um. Um. Pretty, very pretty girl. Well, <laughs> young woman now, I should say. It's Zendaya, isn't it? Maybe so. But good name. <laughs> Either way. So will she work for this character? Is that cool with you? Yeah, yeah. I don't see why let's, not. Let's do that. Yeah, I think that works out really well. So we have things to do. Enrico Iglesias. Uh, That's the musician that I was horribly singing earlier. That is the guy that was the main one that had the sword at your... Oh, him. Enrique Iglesias. That's him. Okay. Isn't it crazy how shit just comes to you later? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I could be your hero, baby. Yeah, it's all good. All right. Anyway, <laughs> one down, ten to go. Okay. So, um, she doesn't know quite what to make of what you said. You said harm and help with a natural one. She just looks at you like, what? <laughs> And throws her hands up like this, and she she has a hold of the lid, and she's looking at you. Um, I need you to roll me a dexterity check. Like, it, how do you want to? I'll let you use one of your skill trees here. Um, it, but you need to describe to me how you're wrestling this this urn or down and around as it's spinning. I'm going to have you do a strength and a dex both. Dex to get there and perform it and do it. And then, uh, did you already rolled one dex to get past the wind, get to it? Yeah, my thinking is, um, using the scarf, tying it between, like, sort of looping it between the two chakrams, and then using the chakrams to, like, sort of loop around to give that leverage to pull it in. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, okay, just do me an attack roll then. Oh, okay. 
Mm, okay, that's uh, so 19. Okay, so we're also seeing something else that's really, really cool here. You're looking at this thing and you're looking at it and you take it from your arm and you wrap it around one of your chakrams. Okay, and as you do, you lasso it around and as it comes around, you catch it in the other arm, and now you've got this wrapped up around the front of the urn. And this is the first time you've ever done something that connects like a chain or something to these. Yeah. And this is a first for you. It's the aha moment. <laughs> What's that? It's the aha moment. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. You're like, oh, yeah. The peanut butter and jelly's pretty good together. So you're, <laughs> you're holding this thing right. Um, now do me a strength uh, ability check. Oh, okay, good. That's a 21. Thank God. Really? <laughs> yeah, thank God. I was sitting there That's like, oh, it's only a plus two. <laughs> okay, yeah, you're able to hold that thing still. As you do, she is picking up and seeing what you're trying to do here. Um, different bystanders are out there trying to grab those chickens and put them back. You know, every movie where there's a windy situation, chickens fly in the seam. I couldn't help myself. So, <laughs> you know, they're trying out there and getting feathers are flying, sand's flying. Your eyes are squinting. You're holding this thing. You're yelling, hurry up, whatever you want to yell. Uh, let's see how she does. Oh, my. She grabs that lid, and she's having a hard time getting it centered and pushed onto what you have and closing this thing completely off. Um, she is going to cast a spell, and I am going to make said spell. Just one minute, okay? I have an idea. Just have to make sure that it works here. Because when we're creating things off the cuff, this kind of shit happens. I do think, by the way, Brian, I might have to go soon um, because I know we're moving wood and I don't want to, I want to, I kind of want to help out. I don't want to be. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you what we'll I'll do. feel bad if I don't help. <laughs> Let me go ahead and do this then. Um, yeah. Sorry, sorry. No, don't, don't be at all. So what she's going to do is, as she's doing that and can't get it to push on top of this vase um, or this urn, um, she takes her arms and she almost looks like uh, the goddess that has multiple arms behind her. Like oh, yes, she has all the different arms, uh, Shiva. Yep. Yes, yes. It, they look phantasmal for just... A moment and she's almost producing what looks like to be an astral projection of several different arms that come up behind her in very stylish dancing ways and as they do all four of her arms now grab onto this lid and seem to push it into place and with using that ability she's able to put the lid back on it okay the second that the lid is on it, the, the, the sandstorm, this little dust devil, dies down completely. Pieces of clothing start floating down to the bottom. Um, the, the lines start, stop shaking, rattling around, and people out of the shops start to look, and you hear a lot of conversation going around, okay? Um, is there anything particularly that you're saying to her? Uh, just kind of sort of trying to catch your breath, just a, um, just a you okay? Okay. Um, having said that, um, she looks up at you and she says, um, let's see, she says, um, you helped me. I did not expect that, especially in, in this place. Uh, oh, uh, I'm, I'm Miyasha and, um, oh, you're a pretty Miyasha. So, th thank you. <laughs> Are you uh, not hot? Sorry. Says, are you not hot with the uh, with the, the fur and the? Oh, um, no, not really. It's we. I grew up here. I'm used to the heat. That now. is fascinating, Miyasha. And she smiles, and she goes, "I." Let me find her name again because I have so many pages. <laughs> I am Golai. Golai. Okay. O L I. She goes, and you have found me trying to contain one of my small little creations. I, I apologize for 
involving you in this mess. Oh no, it's uh, it's all right. I, I uh, I'm fine, and you're fine, and you know, we're fine. It's fine. She goes. That's the scarf. She goes. It seems to have a mind and a life of its own. Uh, yeah. He's uh, she. It's they. Um. You haven't named it. Oh no! I felt like that was rude. <laughs> I didn't want to. I mean, maybe it already has a name. She looks extremely confused by what you're saying right now. <laughs> um. She goes. This magic is not yours to contain. Then this is. This no. is someone else's spell. It, no, it's it's yeah, it's a uh, it's a gift, sort of a gift. reminder. I think it's complicated. I um, You're I'm still trying to. I I am. I aren't you? I I suppose. <laughs> she says, um, with that, let's just for the hell of it, because you have to go, roll a charisma check and I'm going to roll charisma check with her and see how well the two of you get along and how this conversation goes. Oh my god, and that 20, uh that's it's 25. Did you really? Yeah. You're having a good day, Rachel. I I'm I am. Saying, uh caught. Okay, 19. Nice. Okay. You guys, you couldn't have done any better except for one digit. So I'm, I'll go ahead and we'll call this for tonight, but the things to keep in mind moving forward or that you have this girl named Goli, G-O-L-I, okay, that looks the way she does. I'll try to find some imagery of that actress and put into your files, okay? And she seems to be some kind of um, elemental spell weaver that okay. is young and doesn't have control what she's doing. Uh, you seem to have made a friend in her by helping her put this back in the urn of which it was created. And you also have Rasol, R-A-S-O-U-L, the aging Antonio Banderas. And he seems to be someone that is a conjurer and he is making these scarves that are animated and has let you borrow the one for the day that is called the serpent's tongue. Okay. Yeah. And you Magic. also have something to think about. If you would take up residence with Rasol, and work along this mirror um, temple, this mirror pool or whatever you want to call it, um, that would mean that you possibly would not be working with Zachary, with um, Zachary any longer. There's always been a little darkness to him, but you know that your brother has invested some coin in him and you know you're going to go back there within a half hour to start performing this thing that you've prepared. So you're having mixed emotions about what you want to do here. So your character and you have some decent things to think about before we decide to do this again. Does that make sense? Yeah. So overall, a nice little bit of backstory writing here. Yeah, I had fun. Good, I'm glad, dude. Like I said, just last minute shit, just trying to come up with it. And I think at we we'll help do some defining things and we'll see if we can do this again at some point. And, Absolutely. and we can always do this in dream sequences. We can do this however it works for your character. Okay. First, I mean, yeah, I'm happy with anything. Honestly, I'm very flexible here. Cool, man. Cool. Well, try not to break your back loading all that damn wood in the house. It's all good. I'll do my best. <laughs> right on. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and we'll bullshit for another two minutes. Then I'll let you go. Okay. Right, too easy. All right. So thanks again. Um, as Rachel always says, this one was too easy. <laughs> so that's, that's her saying, not mine. And we won't even call this an episode. We'll just call this uh, Miyasha's backstory and we'll easy. go ahead and post it and you can watch it if you'd like. Okay. Awesome. Can All right. Have a good one, everybody. We'll see you. See you.